Can you eat a natural plant root to help you with depression? That's what today's video is about. Curcumin is the active ingredient in the turmeric root. There's significant medical and scientific evidence that says turmeric or curcumin is a powerful antioxidant powerful anti-inflammatory. And there are multiple journal and scientific articles that say it's good especially for osteoarthritis, perhaps weight loss, diabetes control, and even protective for your brain. But there's also significant evidence that it may be helpful in depression. I am Dr. B. I'm a medical doctor and I make videos on topics I find fascinating. So in today's video, we're gonna talk about how does curcumin work in depression? What does the preclinical animal and human data trials show? And what is the best way to take curcumin and safely, how much should you take it and how do you make it most available to your body? Let's get into it. Turmeric is a part of the ginger family. It's a root and if you cut it, it's yellow, orange colored and it's the spice that's used most commonly in curry. It's been used for centuries by traditional Indian and Chinese healers, and the active compounds in turmeric are called curcuminoids, and curcumin is the most studied. It's a polyphenol pigment that gives turmeric and curry its yellowish color. There's been a dozen good randomized controlled clinical trials suggesting that curcumin may be effective as a treatment or an adjunct treatment, meaning added to other treatments for major depression. To understand how curcumin might work, let's look at the proposed mechanisms for depression. Depression is complex, and it's thought to have multiple causes, many of which may occur at the same time. The best known mechanism is from too much or too little neurotransmitters. And remember, neurotransmitters are those chemicals that nerves in your brain use to communicate with each other. The monoamine hypothesis is when you have low transmitters. Now, low levels of serotonin, norepinephrine, and dopamine are seen in depression. And a major mechanism of antidepressant medications is increasing these neurotransmitters. And in fact, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors and selective norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors are the main classes of antidepressants used to increase these neurotransmitters in your brain. There's abundant experimental evidence that curcumin can elevate norepinephrine, serotonin, and dopamine in mice brain, including the frontal cortex, the hippocampus, and even the striatum. Now, not only can not enough transmitters, but too many transmitters can also cause depression. Glutamate is the major excitatory neurotransmitter in the central nervous system. It binds to a receptor that's different than serotonin or norepinephrine, and it's called NMDA. Glutamate is necessary, but when there's overactivation at the NMDA receptors from too much glutamate, it damages neurons over the long term and it especially can break some of the important interconnections between different nerve cells. This is thought to contribute to depression. And glutamate levels have been shown to be elevated in the plasma or the blood, as well as the fluid surrounding the spine and the brain and the brain parenchyma itself in depression. So anything that will decrease the number of receptors, the NMDA receptors, or will compete with glutamate so they can't bind to the receptors will decrease excitation. And this will protect the nerves. And this is exactly how ketamine works. It also works on NMD receptors. Curcumin is thought to reverse glutamate-induced neurotoxicity on brain cells by decreasing the number of NMDA receptors. There's a fascinating human trial where a dose of Prozac, a well-known antidepressant, in a dose that was known to be too low to be effective as an antidepressant, was combined with a low dose of curcumin, also known to be too small to be effective. Together, these two non-effective doses combined and provided a antidepressant effect for the patients. Now inflammation is also thought to play a key role in depression pathophysiology. The hypothesis was really prompted by comparing people who are sick from things like regular flu and depression. In regular sick behavior, people have anorexia, that is they don't feel like eating. They have reduction of locomotor activity, that is they just don't wanna move. They have anhedonia, where there's just really not pleasure in anything that they do. Very similar between being sick and being depressed. But most interesting is if you look at the plasma of people who are sick and depressed, they have very similar inflammatory markers. These markers include C-reactive protein, interleukins one and six, and something known as tumor necrosis factor. Supporting the relationship between depression 
and inflammation. Studies show that when you look at these inflammatory markers in the plasma, these levels can predict whether antidepressant medications will be successful. And there is a fascinating, well done clinical trial in human patients that looked at depressed patients who were given either curcumin or a placebo. And the curcumin population had significantly decreased inflammatory markers compared to those patients who received only a placebo. Now, another factor thought to affect depression is intestinal permeability. What does this mean? Well, in the bowel, there are trillions of bacteria. And to protect your body from these bacteria, your cells have a very tight connection. This is known as a tight junction. And bacteria can't move between the cells. This is known as low permeability nothing can pass between the cells into your blood system. It's like being waterproof or bacteria proof. But in some situations, you get what's called a leaky gut. In leaky gut, parts of the bacteria can pass between the cells and into the circulation. There's lots of tiny holes between the cells and bacterial parts go into your circulation and this can cause an inflammatory response. You can get the same increase in inflammatory markers like I discussed above, the interleukins, the tumor necrosis, and the C-reactive protein. But a fascinating finding is that curcumin can tighten up these connections between the cells and make it bacteria proof again and it makes it hard for the bacteria to penetrate between the cells decreasing the permeability and protecting your brain from inflammation now a final mechanism for depression is what's known as the hypothalamic pituitary axis or HPA. This is a complex feedback system where your hypothalamus and pituitary in your brain communicate with each other and with your adrenal glands, which are located on top of your kidneys. Dysfunction of the HPA system produces too much cortisol. This stress hormone is toxic to nerves and depression is associated with an increased size and activity of the pituitary and the adrenal glands, and the adrenal glands is what secretes cortisol. In animal and human models, curcumin has been shown to alleviate the depressive symptoms induced by cortisol, restoring normal level of cortisol and protecting from neurotoxicity, and has even been shown to shrink adrenal glands back to normal size in rats. Now, if you're going to take turmeric, realize that turmeric root has oxalates, these can predispose to kidney stones, so you really prefer curcumin supplements, not turmeric. And when you do take curcumin supplements, they're not very bioavailable. That means it's not absorbed very well. It's not absorbed well, and it's metabolized very quickly in the liver and excreted. But to get better absorption, you can counteract this by taking it with what's known as piperine. Piperine is a substance found in black pepper, which increases the absorption and usability of curcumin by 2,000 times. Now, curcumin is thought to be safe, and according to the FDA, you can take between 4,000 and 8,000 milligrams a day. That's curcumin. Now, if you consider taking curcumin, please consult a mental health professional prior to taking this for depression. Remember, depression is a complex disease, and it requires professional expertise for safe treatment. Remember, this is an educational video, not medical advice. Thanks for watching. If you've enjoyed this video, try these additional videos on gut brain axis and avoidant personality disorder. And please don't forget to hit subscribe.